going very well so far so good now uh, let me invite uh, dinesh uh, jathadaran a lead process excellence in everest fleet private limited so we talk about completely different topic now it's a business process, process improvement in fleet management so completely you know so it's very rarely such topics we 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 hear in supply chain management and uh, and very rarely we hear somebody like uh, uh, mr ganesh jathadaran uh, there will be it, it there will be a rare opportunity for uh, supply chain organizations to hear somebody like uh, ganesh okay so let me give a quick introduction uh, so uh, mr ganesh is head of anti money laundering at s bank with a background in uh, leading transformation initiatives his experience includes finance process transformation at standard chartered strategy consulting at capgemini and avalon and energy efficiency consulting with cii he specializes in uh, management uh, energy and green consulting and also of course he is a process excellence uh, consultant by himself i i know it's very short introduction uh, mr ganesh so you can brief yourself and i am very in, uh, in, interested to hear you because it's very unusual to hear a different uh, point of view on a different topic okay and which is very relevant for supply chain so over to you mr ganesh sure sure thank you thanks a lot uh, abdul qadir ji for uh, the you know the kind introduction and uh, you know i am i am very happy and glad to be here uh, in this conference you know sharing you know the limited knowledge that i know to uh, people uh, that are gathered here thanks a lot for inviting me uh, so you know just a brief uh, you know background so i, I currently work uh, with this firm called uh, everest fleet and everest fleet is a fleet management uh, firm so it is one of the largest fleet managers uh, for uber in asia as a whole so you know around you know 18000 you know cars is what uh, we have and we are the largest aggregators for uh, uber so i am part of the process excellence team uh, for this uh, you know everest fleet my prior experience like you know abdul qadir ji was mentioning has been you know in, in various fields but largely into you know business excellence process excellence for banks uh, for uh, you know various firms like automobiles is what i have actually worked in fact i have worked with abdul qadir ji in his previous stint you know doing business excellence process excellence that so we know each other right? and uh, thanks a lot for reminiscing and calling me uh, calling me over here right so what i have got today i will you know start sharing my screen what i have got today uh, let me share screen yeah i hope my screen is visible yeah it's coming up yes 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 it's visible yeah yeah so what i have got uh, um, today basically is you know so i have divided the entire presentation into two parts so the first part essentially uh, is about uh, talking about uh, you know the framework for our process excellence that we are practicing in our company so i have tried to make it as uh, practical as uh, possible so instead of you know just talking about uh, theory i just made it what we are essentially doing here in you know uh, everest is what we wanted to basically share right so one minute i'll try and see if i can you know share a screen so that i can see you also perfectly yeah yeah is this visible yes screen is visible the moment you share screen i believe uh, you cannot see yourself but we can see you yeah okay perfect no problem theek okay, hai so let us continue with this approach yeah so uh, so two parts like i said first part is i'll just tell you the framework that we are you know as a process excellency that we are trying to apply to fleet management that's one and uh, secondly i will try and you know uh, explain three or four case studies from my current work from previous work all those things so that you know it it will you know be a practical approach as to how we actually approach a particular problem statement that we have got so that is the approach i have taken for uh, this uh, particular presentation uh, so i'll continue with my first you know part and then i'll pause to see if there are questions and then of course you know we'll go to the second part right so so we have simply you know approached our process excellence uh, you know in our firm 
to tell everybody you know in the organization saying that you know what is our purpose what is our objective our objective is simple we do not involve ourselves into you know business uh, operations day to day we are nothing but a catalyst so catalyst if you remember uh, you know uh, if some of you have studied engineering or chemistry you will know catalyst nothing but it will just help speed up things it will help you know uh, do things better without getting involved into the day to day operation so without being you know uh, without touching uh, or being involved being affected we will just be like a catalyst right without being affected but we will but we will still you know uh, fasten up things for people we will speed up things for people so that's clearly the role of you know the process excellence team and we are a central team offering cross functional support to people so that is clearly the objective and role of the process excellence team that you know uh, we have uh, developed within the organization right and we have told there are three major areas or the framework for excellence is basically upon these three major areas right so and i've got basically case studies to tell you about these three areas but i'll tell what these three, uh, three areas are really about first is about you know making sure processes are standardized right? which is the first vertical what do we mean by standardization to make sure that you know we have process being you know laid down articulated in terms of you know libraries sops you know and making sure it is structured in a central manner there could be cases wherein we may not do it centrally we might actually you know want to have local process but we make sure that at least it is articulated and clearly laid down to people so that's the first you know pillar uh, so to spend in you know, a couple of minutes on the first pillar for various firms that i have worked over the period of you know years specifically in the organization that we are working today also we have found yeah. you know basic things like even process not being spelled out clearly and this will lead to a lot of ambiguity in people knowing what they are supposed to do or what are uh, they ji, sorry sorry to interrupt uh, we are still in the first page okay so yeah, yeah we are still in acha you are still in the first page huh? yeah, is... maybe you are changing it's okay so acha okay so sometimes it happens it... yeah so let me reshare my screen okay. yeah yeah so this was the objective slide I, i i tried to tell we are a catalyst is what we were saying right and a central team so the screen is visible shekh ji yes it is visible objective and role of process excellence correct so this is what i was explaining that we are nothing but a catalyst karke correct and the third slide is this i hope this is visible now yeah yeah so three pillars is what we work on the first pillar is process standardization pillar the second pillar is about you know governance coaching third pillar is business transformation i was explaining the standardization you know uh, pillar so most organization that i worked i mean i worked with mncs i worked with indian private banks i'm currently working with a fleet management firm very indian right so what we find is clearly articulating how we do things which is the process part of it is a big miss right and even if they express it clearly they will not basically express in a standard manner that everybody understands so this is a big area or an opportunity that one can actually work on you know process standardization area right so i have got basically case studies as to tell how to you know express oneself in terms of doing the how part so that's the first part so that it is standardized structured streamlined so that's so that's the first part the second part is now that i have defined the process it is very important that people follow it how do we ensure that people follow it if they do not follow why are they not following it you know creating problem solvers about you know how to actually follow this all those are the second part of the things the third part is a completely different area now that i have defined the process i make sure that people follow the process how do we improve it what should we want do to actually improve this so this basically forms the bedrock of process excellence that we are currently doing within our organization and what what i have done personally in my prior experiences also right like i told the excellence team will be a catalyst 
ensuring the teams on the ground do these things properly we'll guide them we'll coach them we'll audit them we'll help them improve but on the ground work is something that the business functions have to do so the role of cross excellence team is more like a catalyst okay so this in essence basically is the framework that we are currently using in the process excellence you know piece now before i go into explaining this a little bit of you know detail you know anybody having questions you know please feel free to jump in because i believe in you know interactive sessions wherein you know i do not want it to be a monologue you know please feel free to jump in and ask me any questions because i want to make sure that you know whatever i know at least is communicated clearly to you people right so yeah, any sure, questions sure. you have please let me know yeah sure sure definitely i'll just uh, raise a flag yeah. sure okay so the uh, so if i double click on you know process standardization what do we mean by process standardization so what we do in a sense or what we are doing also currently is we are you know taking a particular city so we operate in multiple you know cities and this city can be you know translated as different business functions or same business function having different branches or different units that you are operating could be you know in, in uh, applied to various you know ways that you are working and you are actually functioning so what we do is we particular so we actually take a particular city we create a process library when we mean process library we understand what are all the various processes that constitute your particular universe of business so once that library is being created we articulate the process through process maps and the process map we define here and you will be clear when i explain through a case study through standard notation called bpmn bpmn as i have given here if you can see my mouse is stands for business process model notation so every process needs to be you know explained or articulated in this business process model notation okay. once you explain it in a business process model notation bpmn format then it becomes easy for you to even speak to technology when i mean speak to technology when you change a process diagram automatically technology also can change so if you change say a box in a diagram automatically your sap or you know your oracle can understand this bpmn because this bpmn is actually a codable diagram so i will i will show you the example when i am actually talking through the case study so so far you know i'm just going to give you a preview as to you know what the standardization is all about so this bpmn basically will help you articulate your process in a codable format which technology you know understands and we also clearly articulate what are the kpis to achieve these process right so this we do so this combo of process library which is nothing but a list of process articulating in you know bpmn format the process it looks something like this which you see on screen and then along with the kpis begin one set of standard process right for a city or a particular hub or a branch whatever you can call it once that is done we take similar inputs from the other cities we have a workshop with all the relevant stakeholders from the city and from the various functions and then one process standard is defined for the organization as a whole right so this basically constitutes the framework for standardizing a process right so this is step 1 so the, if i go back the process standardization pillar if i double click it basically becomes this right so this is you know the pillar one now if i move to pillar two which is process governance pillar what we do in process governance is all about now that i have you know articulated the process now it is important for the organization to be process based and not people based to do that people have to adhere to the process so we initiate something called as a process audit exercise wherein we go as a team and actually check whether people are actually following these process right so this is the assess process adherence tracking the non compliance publishing the audit scores okay and updating the the register wherein you know all these audits are audit scores and non compliance are actually published and we ensure that these are actually you know adhere to and align the kras to the process you know governance aspect so this is basically the framework of doing the process governance in a nutshell what we essentially are trying to tell is we basically go to the you know units understand the processes defined here are basically adhered to or not through a process audit exercise and we publish a score for each of these units so this is basically the process governance angle 
the third angle which is so the third framework area or the third area that we actually work on completely different from the first two areas is all about improvements one and two talks about defining the process adhering to it third is completely breaking free from that trying to improve things you know on a day-to-day -day basis now how do we improve things is basically you know by having two different aspects to it one is phase one phase two phase one is all about creating understanding the asset state and defining the to be state so you understand the current vision assess what is needed benchmark vis-a-vis -vis your competition and design the to be process now once these you know are agreed on paper then we start about implementing this so these are the three um, pillars in which we operate within the current organization in terms of process excellence also so let me repeat we defined about process standardization which is about defining the process then we govern by doing audits third is breaking free from that designing the current process and then you know creating a to be state and trying to achieve it so that you go to the next level so this in essence is basically like a cycle wherein we try and you know excel in what we are doing at it or improving what we are doing at it. So this basically forms a framework. What I have got in the subsequent slides are essentially case studies to explain all these three that I'm talking about, right? So this could be a logical, you know, break where I can actually take about 30 seconds understanding if there are questions, Abdul Garja ji, or, you know, if you want me to continue with case studies explaining each of these, I uh, can go. Process is very, uh, Ganesh ji, I think uh, case studies will raise more questions. Perfect. So let me jump on to the case studies. Okay. So process standardization, let me actually tell you what we are practically doing on the ground. So this is, you know, so in our fleet operations, our most important process is to recruit drivers. So we own the cars, right? And we need drivers to drive the car. So driver essentially will be our customers who will drive the fleet, which ultimately goes and they actually go and join, you know, Uber. So that's essentially is what, we are doing and you know this process of you know uh, driver recruitment or pilot recruitment what we do is we express this in terms called bpmn language okay and bpmn language is a standard terminology or a standard process you know notation terminology where one should use so that it can be useful because this is a standard terminology that everybody can understand within the organization once they are trained and most importantly, BPMN can interface with technology tools also. Okay, so probably I'll show you a live demo as to what this BPMN is, you know, all about. But before that, what is L1? What is L4? L1 is nothing but, you know, the most top process. So the, so the left hand side is something like an L1, right hand side is something like a L4. What is left hand side all about? Left hand side is about telling what are the various macro steps that is needed for conducting this process. So in this case of driver recruitment, I have three major process called lead generation, telecalling and backend process, wherein I actually call the, you know, telecaller. I mean, I actually call, so the telecallers call the drivers. And third, we actually onboard these driver and allocate the vehicles. So these are the three macro steps, which are, which, which form the, uh, you know, the pilot recruitment uh, process. So pilot recruitment to repeat is about recruiting the drivers to drive the car. So we call them pilots, you know, in our organization, right? So we generate the leads, the lead generation car, there is actually a separate process. Then once the leads are generated, we, we actually call these, you know, uh, drivers through our, you know, BPO setup, wherein, uh, so through our telecalling setup, wherein these drivers are reached out to, and then they're onboarded. Now I have taken a slice of basically the vehicle, you know, onboarding and vehicle allocation process. I've drilled it down directly to L4. L4 is nothing but if I click on onboarding vehicle allocation, it will expand to an L2 process, which will detail this onboarding to the next level. If we click it further, it will go to the next level. If we click it further, I will reach to this step of, you know, L4 process, wherein, you know, desktop procedures or close to desktop procedures will be described. So that is in essence the L4 process, which is expressed in BPMN terminology. So BPMN terminology is nothing but I have basically will tell who are all the various parties. So there's a swim lane which is there. Who are all the various parties that are involved in, you know, conducting this, scheduling this driver and creating the, you know, creation of the IDs before the 
the driver actually takes a vehicle. That in a sense is what is being explained here, right? So let, if I just zoom it a bit, what you can see is, you know, the driver is basically targeted. So, so the driver is tagged as interested by the telecallers, right? Once the driver is tagged as telecaller, he asks the driver to send documents on WhatsApp. The document is received. Once the document is received, the driver basically, so the telecaller basically, so the, so the, so the simulation is about the telecaller. The telecaller fills the Google form. Once the Google form is captured in the response sheet, there is an Uber ID that's being created. There is a background check that's being done. And then, this, and then the schedule form for the driver is filled. The driver walks into the hub. There is no issue. If there is issue, the issue is being resolved. Or, you know, if the driver does not walk in, I follow up the driver uh, to actually make sure he actually reaches my hub and he takes a car. Right. So this is the detailed steps of this onboarding and vehicle allocation. So, I mean, if one just needs to take a step back, what is happening is the onboarding and vehicle allocation process ka one slice ka detail is what is being given here. Now L4 can be further drilled down to L5 process also, wherein you actually define it a little more granular and, and, and say in a little more depth so that the person who's actually executing or who's handling the, you know, the customer in our case, a driver knows it very clearly and there is no confusion as to what he or she is expected to do. Right. So this in essence basically will be, you know, the process diagram and how to express it. What I will also do is let me show you an example of uh, Ganesh ji, uh, just a question here. Now, yeah. as we all understand Uber, uh, so how, uh, how does that in, in Uber basically uh, the driver comes along with his vehicle, right? Uh, so uh, that it's, I know it's not the process uh, is, uh, question I'm talking about the business mm -hmm. model. Okay, so you said. Uh, in the in the business process he will collect and uh, he will collect the vehicle okay mm -hmm. so how, what is the model here sir so in everest fleet and yeah. uber that just say quick because it's very interesting uh, we, I, I don't know about that there is so much story behind behind this yeah mm -hmm. yeah, yeah of course so uh, yeah so the way it works is um, i mean so the so the way Uber works and, and you know, this everybody knows is Uber basically has drivers who take the vehicles, right? Yeah. So the way it works is Uber basically uh, onboards uh, drivers directly through their own platform and the driver owns the vehicles and it is my vehicle. I get, you know, money from the customer. The, so the rider Correct. takes a commission and Baki mm -hmm. basically is going to the, uh, say the driver. Mm -hmm. because he owns the car now there could be other models in which the driver does not own the vehicle he can take the vehicle on lease like operators okay. like everest fleet mm -hmm. ah, okay so i so that part operator uh, everest uh, does okay okay exactly so there are aggregators for uber so uber need not so uber does not own even a single vehicle yeah that's 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 true mm -hmm. right so the vehicle can be an asset on the books of the driver or there can be organizations like Everest, which will actually own these vehicles and they'll manage the driver. So I'll have to onboard these drivers, manage the driver and the fleet so that the rider through Uber get a smooth ride. So that's the entire value chain comes to it. So how many vehicles uh, Everest has now? Around 17,000 vehicles. Wow, oh, that, that's something uh, that is very interesting. I don't know that, that, that so much. Uh, vehicles are uh, uh, the third party logistic companies are working like that so that is something amazing fantastic please proceed yeah yeah correct yeah. so so basically i was trying to tell i mean in the process of you know managing this business how do we you know manage the uh, okay. aspect of process here excellence here is what i'm trying to tell so i was talking about bpm and i don't mm -hmm. know thing is not working okay so probably for some reason, I'm not able to show you a live demo. Uh, I would have loved to show you as to how to actually create these diagrams. Let me try once more. If I can show this to you. Reason. It is not working. 
Give me one second. Let me stop sharing and then let me start sharing. Have an issue. Hmm. Okay, fair. So some issue I'm not able to share oh, mm -hmm. the actual BPM and diagrams. I mean the demo of this thing. So you you can easily go to the site called you know demo dot BPMN. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know you can you know experiment yourself and try things yourself. So the advantage, like I said, is once you create something like this, you know, and if I right click, you know, this diagram. I mean, once the actual diagram opens, you will know it opens to a page like a code page. Mm -hmm. Which means each of these boxes are transcribed like a code, mm -hmm. right? So once you change the box here, like say ask driver to do something, you know, whatever. The system understands what you're actually doing because all these are you know standard notations, which is understandable by you know technologies like SAP uh, mm -hmm. and you know Oracle. There are a lot of interfaces available. You can Google for SAP Aris. Uh, you will know what I'm talking about. So these boxes can speak to the system, and the system will you know change the code by itself. Yeah, that's true. For a person like a business guy, because he is just eliminating okay. the technology in an analyst or a functional analyst layer here. Yeah. So, you know, uh, so highly encourage people you know, in this conference who are attending to Google for SAP ARIS or uh, you know, SAP BPMN you know, integration or something like that. Then you will understand what I'm actually talking about. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to show my Chrome. I'm oh. not able to. So you here. Otherwise, I could have actually showed you some example. Let me try one last time. Yeah, it's working. So if you just say SAP or SABPMN dot IO. I personally know, know about BPMN. Yeah. Oh, perfect. So yeah. So you know, you can just create a diagram here. It's very simple. And uh, try online. This becomes demo. Yeah, you can just create a diagram. Let's open. Sorry, let's create something. Let me actually see if we can open a diagram. Um, yeah, let's see if this opens. Perfect. So this opens, right? So this is a diagram that we created, simple. And if I just you know go to and you know, which view page source, a code actually comes. So this is something that you can interface with, you know, this thing you can, you know, either easily usable, you can put swim lanes here, all those things. This is, you know, very, very user friendly for people. It's free, it's available, people can start using it. Yeah, so that's, you know, one part of, you know, the aspect which you wanted to cover, which was the first pillar of standardization and how do we do standardization? How do we integrate with things? So let's move to the second part, actually, yeah, so the, the Second part is about, you know, auditing what I have drawn here. So audit Kaylee, what we have done is we have uh, created, you know, frameworks to do audit. So I'm just going to show you some examples of those frameworks that we have created. So this is, you know, uh, essentially this I have not shared because it's very proprietary uh, uh, Sheikh Ji, but you know, I'm just showing you samples so that people understand how we actually go about doing audits. So what we do is we create, you know, checklist of questions uh, uh, like this, which is there. We say, let me actually show you the actual checklist. Now, this is a review aspect. For example, you know, in the same telecaller process, we are saying, you know, if telecaller actually providing proper resolution to the lead as per the leads inputs, the number of follow up you do, all these things are basically created as a checklist for the process that we have created. So I've created a diagram. I'm now creating, you know, long list of questions which I want to actually go and check on the ground. Are actually people doing it or not? If they do it, they actually get a score of, you know, compliance. If they don't do it, then actually get a score of non-compliance. This complaints and non-compliance basically get summarized and we publish it as a score saying, you know what, you actually are non-compliant. This is non-compliant, not complaint by the way. You are non-compliant to the score of say 100%. You're not complaining to the score of say 80%. All those things is what we create using this audit methodology, right? So to do that, we have say an audit 
uh, you know, my checkpoint, which is what I was telling you here. There's an entire list of questions that we go ahead and ask people. Say for this case, we created a question of 140, 150 you know, questions. Before we start the audit, we create this checklist. We circulate this checklist to them. We make sure that people actually, you know, uh, are, are ready uh, for our audit. We check whether they're complying or not. We categorize them into various buckets, critical to business, not critical to business, all those things. And then we publish finally the summary report, which is what you see here. You know, what is the complaints percentage? It's only 25 percentage for this business, whereas we need a target of 90 percentage. So once we publish this, it's become very visual and uh, people, you know, start acting on, you know, uh, these things and the adherence level automatically improves. So one of the key things that we have personally, you know, observed uh, and we have known to be very, very effective is this assessment or audit or coaching. I mean, we can call it coaching, audit, assessment, but it's ultimately understanding how much are people following what they're supposed to follow. Because as a business head, I want my people to follow things, but are they actually following it or not? This is where the actual cookie I have seen invariably crumbling. So even when I have handled my AML department you know, uh, separately when regulators ask me questions or even I'm actually doing cross exchange now, this is one of the most important areas I have felt wherein a lot of effectiveness can be built in. It's the second uh, uh, vertical of, you know, governing and, you know, making sure people following it. Now, once the scores are being published, what we will do is we have coaches appointed who will understand handhold with these respective cities or hubs to you know make sure that they actually solve these issues and move forward to make sure they're complying. So this is where we have mentioned about you know coaching and improving. So that's the second you know big vertical of governing, improving, and coaching, right? So we have discussed about standardizing process. We have also discussed about how do we govern, improve, and coach you know people. So that in a sense is the first two pillars that we spoke about. Okay. I'm assuming, you know, I can move uh, uh, Abdul Ghaji uh, if, if, if there are questions, please let me know. I can, you know, pause again and uh, go to the third subject of, you know, improvement and transformation. Yeah. Okay. So third area, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very broad area. I mean, so the improvements can be for anything. So in this case, you know, for us, one of the problem statements we have identified was on attrition of the uh, drivers because, you know, the, so the car's utilization is a, so, so the function of the utilization of the vehicles has a big bearing on how soon the driver attrates or not attrates in this case. So to understand this, what we did was we created basically a satisfaction assessment uh, type of, you know, uh, survey or assessment framework to know if you know to so to actually gauge what is the current satisfaction levels of the drivers so what we did here was uh, you know we created so we created a framework for satis uh, satisfaction assessment there were six broad parameters starting from quality you know the earning uh, uh, potential of the driver are there any uh, you know uh, um, uh, uh, are there any issues with respect to the workshop quality that we have got, the repair quality of the, you know, of, of, of the cars, which is the third aspect. The fourth aspect was about how soon or, or uh, how clean are we able to deliver the cars to these drivers. The last aspect were about, you know, how do they value the relationship with our company? All those things is what we try to understand. So in all, there were six broad parameters broken down to 27 smaller attributes, for example, quality of the car can be measured in terms of say vehicle performance are they actually conforming to specifications in terms of you know vehicle specifications fuel consumption all those things comes the quality of the car salary earnings is about you know are they actually you know earning are their earning capacity enough through this partnership are we actually taking initiatives to improve their earning so basically the framework i mean instead of following what we do so the framework is all about having you know higher level parameters broken down to sub attributes so that you have a comprehensive survey mechanism which you can go and ask your respective customers to understand what they actually feel about you know the company so once we have done the survey so in all we met around say 500 or 600 you know um, driver partners and once we have done we did you know we actually plotted it into a graph to tell 
you know, which are the parameters, which are the cities that are actually doing well. In this case, Hyderabad scored well, you know, better than all, whereas Kolkata was actually the least. And in terms of parameter, management related was the best. Salary earnings were the least. And they were, you know, below average DSAT, right? So if you, if I actually go down a little bit you know, further, what we understood, and so again, what we are trying to, you know, do this is, in case of Hyderabad is actually scoring better, where they are actually scoring better in terms of parameters, where they are actually not scoring better. So if you see, you know, this is, so the green dotted area is where in terms of parameter and city, we are doing well. Whereas this area, which is orange and red is where we actually, you know, totally suck. I mean, we actually are not doing great. So this is the area that, you know, we felt that we'll have to you know, work. Of course, I have masked certain areas in terms of confidentiality, but you know, I'm just trying to understand, I mean, explain how did we approach this problem in terms of having a parameter attribute, doing the survey, trying to plot it, and you know trying to understand which areas we are doing well and which areas we are not doing well and these are the areas that we have taken up as an initiative from our firm to see you know how do we meet drivers satisfaction levels so that is in a nutshell about you know how do we improve driver attrition or how do we act how do we go about you know understanding doing a customer satisfaction survey and what are the actions I mean, how, how do we create an actions out of it there are the first case study that I thought I'll, I'll you know, uh, explain. The second, probably I'll skip this, probably the other, uh, yeah, so, so the second is about how do we approach sourcing parts. But before I go here, you know, I'll again pause here to see, you know, any questions, any, uh, you know, areas that you wanted to understand a little more further, I can, you know, take those questions or I'll move to the, you know, the last case study, which I've got, uh, Abdul Kajaji. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, please, please move forward. Okay, fantastic. So the last area I've got here is about, you know, so we have, so this is not from, you know, the current engagement that I am at, so, so the current firm, but, you know, previous firm, wherein to manage their, you know, uh, their cars or their fleets, whatever they have got. So they wanted to basically source parts from outside India. So this, this case study is all about, you know, how do we actually source parts into India? And how do we make sure that, you know, I uh, achieve benefits by sourcing parts from the right supplier and at a cost effective manner. So this framework basically explains about how do we go about doing this? What is the approach that one should take to, you know, go about shortlisting the suppliers, identify what, you know, these parts are and where we actually get the benefits. So the approach that we took here was we created a very long list of companies of, you know, internationally not just India. So we created, you know, long list of companies for the vehicles that this particular, you know, fleet or this particular service station had in their workshop, understood, you know, the list of parts that there were, say, for example, that there were around 400 parts that we actually came up with. We did 80, 20 of those parts and said that you know, these are the parts for which I need suppliers, wherein there'll be a maximum bank for the buck. So we created a long list of companies by scoring to various geographies internationally. Right. And by contacting these suppliers, we actually created a short list of suppliers from this long list. And after that, we engaged with these suppliers and we created a prioritized list of partners along with the parts wherein we created a face to face discussion and said that these are the parts from these suppliers that we should actually go about and, you know, engaging or having the transactions with. So that was the overall, you know, process framework that we used to start with the long list of companies, short list, and finally, you know, go with the prioritized list. So the prioritization framework that we practically used here was, you know, aspects of reliability, aspects of business fit, and aspects of size fit. For example, you know, I am a very large company, but I do not want to have a very small company, you know, participating with me because then it becomes, you know, size misfit. So that's also something that we, you know, had. Business fit is, you know, what is the quality of the product? What is the portfolio of product they have got? What is their current client deal they have got? What is the business fit aspect that we have there that we actually you know, assessed? The other is about you know, reliability. Do these exporters at least have bare minimum a website? Do they have you know, solid recommendations? How long have they been into this business? Where certain things that we actually got. This is this we created you know, a weighted average framework for each of these. And we of course ranked it as 139 to create you know, an exponential difference between you know, a guy so a supplier who's actually scoring well versus, you know, a supplier who's not scoring well. 
basis that we identified basis the for, for the model that we have got we identified suppliers you know who will actually provide us these parts so this is our current you know clients price this is the fob price of the parts that we import from the suppliers we have identified to the previous slide right mm -hmm. this is that we found out that for the 75 top parts for these you know cars or models the saving in terms of inr per annum is going to be around 45 lakhs if i import vis-a-vis -vis me actually procuring it locally right so that was basically the final you know aspect or final savings that we actually brought down and uh, you know nailed it so that is how we approach you know these things so i just wanted to give you a flavor of you know all these three rather than you know telling a variety of things across variety of areas again these three areas standardization i spoke about the bpmn Governance, I explained about the audit transformation. I actually spoke about, you know, two large projects. One is about the supplier, you know, uh, sourcing project. And the other one was uh, basically about the project of, you know, customer satisfaction with, you know, the frameworks. So, you know, these were, you know, the points I thought, let me actually, you know, share and explain as to what, you know, I have been practically doing. But of course, you know, happy to take questions or any clarifications. If it was fast somewhere, please let me know. I can. I'll be more than happy to, you know, explain things. Yeah, it's very uh, great insights, uh, Ganeshji. I really liked the way you have explained the, these three steps. Okay, I personally uh, worked on uh, business process excellence initiatives a uh, long time ago. So I understand uh, the, uh, the work you have done and uh, the way you have uh, uh, sh uh, showcased the uh, use cases. Really fantastic. Okay, now the question is, uh, uh one of the key problem for especially mid-size organizations and uh, little smaller organizations is they they are not like a, they don't want to standardize their processes that is one of the key problem okay so as a solution provider or software provider at the moment earlier i was some, somebody like you who are helping organizations in supply chain excellence and all those stuff uh one of the major problem is uh the challenge of the mid-size and smaller organizations remains same as the larger ones. But the, the key difference is they don't have the standard processes. So each small mid-size company, they think that this is how the business have to be done. And they go in a non-standard way. And they don't practice any business process methodology. Okay. And what happens is they want to fit their process into any software or any other things. So there is a gap. Okay, and they don't invest enough. Okay, they don't invest enough to uh, either to to adjust themselves or to adjust the software. Then eventually, what what will happen is, so they adopt the software uh, processes like 50, 60, 70 percent, whatever, and then the remaining 30 percent they keep it manual. So on the whole, uh, the the core pro the key processes like invoicing and all billing they will do it in the system, but the rest of the process still they keep it manual. So this is one of the key problem what I observed over a period of uh, so many years now in India and uh, somewhere else in Middle East. So what do you advise? So what is the, your advice for the organizations to go for a standard business process and then, then you automate it and then you optimize it and then you focus more onto a business than process because the process takes its own uh, pace and then invest in it. Don't consider this as a, an expense. You consider this as an investment. So, what is your stake in this? Yeah. So, absolutely. I, like you rightly said, there are two you know types of organization. One one are those large. You know, I've I've worked in banks where in you know, RBI audits the bank. So, you know, needless to mention that you know processes are very important there, and you know we have some maturity there. But I think the problem is with these you know middle sized firms, unregulated entities, you know, where they actually have their own way of working. My practical experience has been, you know, should I start with standardizing the process first and then assessing them and then giving it to technology or should I assess them first and, you know, standardize it, right? Now, the question can be without a process, how do you go about, you know, doing audits or assessment, right? So what we did practically here was we said, you know what, it is a going concern. There are definitely process which people are actually doing it. It's not as if. There is no process. There is a process. Of course, there are issues in people doing it consistently, right? 
say for example you know uh, i will give you a practical example when you know managing in my fleet the way we manage a fleet is when a you know car enters my premise i'll have to know when the car enters so there should be a check in time and when the car enters i also should know are the tires in proper condition does it have you know a jack pana atomy stepney all those things and we also have a car sticker which is there you know to tell you know what the driver wanted car sticker if you observe uber in you know in various geographies you'll have you know a number piche behind the car which says you know this is the number you have to call all these things needs to be checked this is a standard process which everybody needs to follow there is an sop for this everybody knows but when we go, when we actually went and saw this nobody is following this process on the ground the person and these are all very huge impact items huh? while it seems very small imagine 17000 cars not being you know managed well if you know stepney is not done properly if you know things like you know these stickers are not there you know it has a huge cascading impact right so then we decided probably let us start you know auditing this and we use a strong word called audit why did we use a strong word called audit because the moment i use an audit and a strong uh, you know a score mechanism there to tell you know what you only score 20% and we put a red big font logo there it actually catches people's attention because they know they are in the limelight now then they start asking me ganesh how do we solve this problem now please help me if i had taken the approach one wherein i actually go them you know soft pedal with them asking them you know what please tell me the sop i will draw for you and you know please follow the process you know the please from there from our side becomes you know please from their side <laughs> so we actually flipped i mean that is working here right I, that i have also seen work with you know banks also i mean while it is a very you know uh, complaints or you know a very a strong approach but probably depending upon the company's maturity these type of treatments might be needed for the different i mean again if you actually talk about western firms middle east firms or with maturity might be different you might not want to use audit as a terminology there you might want to use coaching as a terminology there because audit simply is about fault finding exercise right but the moment you make people understand hey i'm actually doing an audit for you you are the stakeholder that i'm actually going to do for then probably things might you know change and you know they might you know then want to have process standardized this, then the process will be standardized you can have technology come in all those things will come in probably you know to answer you straight we can think of starting with an assessment auditing first because there are process already happening and we have to understand the business before you know auditing the process that's very important otherwise you will be lost without you know process document i hope i answered your question na huh? shekh ji yeah 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 got you got you got you sir this is very interesting i would like to share to all our clients and other uh, partners uh, your presentation and it's very very interesting uh, yeah so and the bpnm bpmn uh, concept was really interesting and i was really amazed to see the process of everest fleet with 17000 cars okay i was it's a completely new for me uh, i to me is such a large number of fleet and uh, uh, the process you must be definitely having a very good discipline of business process otherwise it is not possible okay so Uh, one question is i think it's not related to the process how do you generate leads uh, so you you look for the drivers who subscribe to uber or how how because how do, how do you find leads uh, for everest uh, pilots yeah. mean yeah yeah so uh, pilot basically we have two different sources uh, shekh ji one is you know the car wanted stickers so you would have seen you know on uber there is a car wanted sticker so drivers basically call these things that's one you know source we of leads so we call it inbound call that comes so other major sources we you know put a lot of you know facebook ads social media ads all those things where you know the driver interested so there are various portals where like oh, we have naukri and linkedin for you know this group which is here on this call drivers have their own you know job portals so they apply in these job portals and those leads you know so we subscribe to those things and those comes to us fantastic that's a great business so i think uh, we need to talk more about this and uh, i think you have a lot of use cases in finance in banking okay so i think we don't have for time today otherwise you know would have definitely asked for uh, presenting one more use case today so with uh, with this uh, uh, thank you very much uh, ganesh ji
uh, I know this is the topic is very heavy. Depends. Uh, I don't think they can really ask a question, but I'm sure they really enjoy the session uh, of your three steps uh, audit, and then you have a process, a standardize the process, then you, you establish the discipline, and then you measure it and approve the performance. It's fantastic. Okay, so I would like to, I take this as an opportunity. If you have any final thoughts for a couple of uh, two, three minutes, please, please uh, uh, feel free because uh, you lost a uh, few minutes time in the beginning. So any final thought, any, any advice for supply chain organizations as far as the project yeah, excellence so, is concerned? No, no, first of all, thank you, you know, Abdul Kadeji for inviting me over. And, you know, uh, this is a, you know, I, I definitely love uh, uh, these sessions because, you know, some contribution that uh, we can uh, do to people that are uh, attending here at least if they had taken you know high percentage of what uh, you know i had told that i think that is my personal you know success of attending or you know uh, participating in the seminar i hope you know people had uh, you know found it to be uh, useful that's one and thanks a lot for that opportunity secondly you know i feel uh, process excellence is something that people do not pay a lot of attention to these days in you know in the hurry of you know doing business and in their day-to-day -day pressure of uh, you know uh, establishing themselves or in their roles in the organization because they have their own pressures i've handled teams you know the two highly regulated teams the immense pressure on you know the person who's handling things so usually you know people uh, tend not to invest in these things assuming that you know this will not yield results but trust me you know if you have the you know the capacity you know influence your bosses have somebody uh, you know that bandwidth who will not be involved in the day, -day business because this requires somebody who is like you but you know who is dispassionate and who is able to actually you know contribute and comment in what you are doing because otherwise you will have thousand things to do in your life every day at least 10 decisions 15 decisions tough decisions to be taken which will eat your you know brain and minds very important to have a sounding board, a person who is, you know, separately there, who will drive, you know, things for you, like, you know, process excellence. That will, you know, help you have peace at work and also improve things. Perfect. So, this is, that's a really wonderful advice, uh, Kaneshi. Thank you very much. And uh, I think uh, uh, if you have, if you want to give any final thoughts, otherwise we will just uh, say your word of thanks to you. So it is really, uh, at least for me, you know, I really enjoyed the session uh, thoroughly. Uh, and and uh, hearing somebody like you is something which is very, uh, very interesting. Okay. And after a long time, I see you also. So that's very interesting. So thank you, Ganesh, uh, for joining and delivering wonderful lecture. And we look forward for, for more such uh, programs from you. Uh, uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, appreciate on behalf of... Uh, all the participants and organizers to you thank you very much yeah thank you thanks a lot i wish you you know success in your endeavors thank you thanks a lot see you